Daniel chapter 3, if you have your Bible with you. Daniel chapter 3. It's incredible because, you know, you look at this chapter and you realize that it wasn't just written for the guys that experienced it 2,500 years ago. This was written for our encouragement. It, it, was, it was to remind us of, you know, what it is that, that you and I are to do in difficult situations. Kind of put yourself in, in the shoes of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. The king commands them to bow down and worship this idol. And we'll get into the text in a second. And they, they have to make a decision. You know, am I going to do what the king wants me to do? Or am I going to do what God wants me to do? And if I do what the king wants me to do, I, I, I can probably just kind of walk away from all of this without any ramifications without any any trial any tribulation just kind of do it I don't even have to do it in my heart I just got to do it in my outward uh, you know appearance but if I do what God's asked me to do it's going to cost me everything And I think all of us, you know, at some point in our life, we have to make those kinds of decisions. You know, am I going to do what's right in God's eyes or am I going to do what, you know, what everyone else wants me to do? What our world wants me to do, what our government wants me to do, what um, my friends want me to do. I mean, we're faced with those same decisions all the time. And you and I got to come to those conclusions. And I think it's an amazing chapter because I think one of the things you learn in the life of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego is that they had already made the decision before they ever came to the situation. They already knew what they were going to do in spite of the threats that were going to come their way. You see, by bowing down to the idol that they were asked to bow down to, they would be in direct conflict with what God declared. In the book of Exodus, chapter 20, verse 4, it says this, You shall not make for yourselves a carved image, any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them, nor serve them, for I am the Lord your God. Watch what he says. I am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers of the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me. Interesting passage, because think about what had happened. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had just been taken into captivity because their fathers and their forefathers had fallen into the trap of idolatry. And now they're in the land of Babylon, and the king of Babylon is asking them to do the very same things that got them into the position they are in in the first place. Captivity, slavery, bondage. And they have to decide, man, am I going to do what's right? Or am I going to just compromise a little bit? And as we come to chapter 3, notice how the text begins to unfold the story. It says, Nebuchadnezzar, the king made an image of gold whose height was 60 cubits. It's with six cubits. He set it in the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. Now, if you remember chapter two, Nebuchadnezzar had a dream and the dream was a dream of a enormous statue. The head of gold, the neck and the chest was silver. The hips and downward were bronze and then the final part of that was iron and the toes and the feet were iron mixed with clay and Daniel explained to him what the dream was all about he says let me tell you something Nebuchadnezzar the gold is you that you're you're the first kingdom you're the most powerful kingdom of all the kingdoms but you're going to be replaced by another kingdom and then another kingdom and then another kingdom and what Nebuchadnezzar was declaring is look I'm the one that's going to be the head the chest the waist 
and the feet. There's God's wrong, I'm right. What God declared of someone replacing my kingdom will never happen. And because and, it's all gold now. That, that was the image he had made. And it was 90 feet tall and it was nine feet wide. And it was in direct rebellion to what God had revealed to him. One of the commentators, Wolver, if you get a chance to pick up Wolver on, on the book of Daniel, an incredible commentator on the book of Daniel, Wolver says that Nebuchadnezzar had a coup attempt upon his life and he came out of it and it's as a result of that that he's making this image and he was really getting the loyalty of his whole nation to say, you know, King, we, we worship you as a god. And that's what set this up. This would have been about nine years after that dream that had taken place in chapter 2. And he sets up this whole thing where he calls together all of his leaders. And he has them meet them. Look at verse 2. And King Nebuchadnezzar sent word to gather together the satraps, the administrators, the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the judges, the magistrates, and all the officials of the providence to come to the dedication of the image which King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. So it was across the whole land. He's saying, everyone, you know, gather together all of those in positions of power, positions of influence. Anyone who has any kind of say in the kingdom, you need to be here for this. It's interesting that as a result of the coup, uh, Wolver comes out and he says, Daniel wasn't required to be there because Daniel would have already proven his loyalty because he stood by Nebuchadnezzar's side in the middle of the coup. One explanation of it. Some believe that Daniel was out doing the Nebuchadnezzar's bidding or business in other regions. And so that's why he wasn't here. But Daniel's missing in this picture. It's Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They're going to be in the middle of this. And it's in verse 3, it says, So the satraps, the administrators, the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the judges, the magistrates, and all the officials of the province, they gathered together for the dedication to the image that the king Nebuchadnezzar had set up, and they stood before the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. And a herald cried out loud, To you it is commanded, O peoples, nations, and languages, that at the time you hear the sound of the horn, the flute, the harp, the lyre, the psaltery, and and symphony, with all kinds of music, you shall fall down and worship the gold image that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. Gathers them all together. He just kind of says, okay, guys, here it is. There's going to be a big symphony take place. All the instruments are going to, you know, go and they're going to, they're going to create this beautiful worship song. And all at once you bow down and, and, and the idea of bowing down is prostrating yourself. And it's the idea of bringing yourself under the submission of what you worship or what you bow down to. That's this whole idea, idea of, of us worshiping God. It, it's, you know, when you're raising your hands or you're lifting your voice, it's, you're acknowledging God, you're worthy of all of the praise. And Nebuchadnezzar is looking that for that for himself. He wanted to be worshipped. He becomes a type of not only Antichrist, but I believe he becomes a type of Satan in this picture here. Because Satan is always looking to be worshipped. He's always looking for your devotion. He's always, you know, anytime he can take the attention away from God and put it upon himself, you know, he considers it to be a success. And what's amazing is you look at this, this whole story, you know, kind of, uh, uh, kind of play out is it really does lay out for us, you know, kind of a last day scenario. Because when the Antichrist comes on the scene, he's going to want a one world religion. And that one world religion is all going to be the worship of the Antichrist, which is going to be a man infilled with Satan. And it's incredible because there was a consequence for not 
bowing down and worshiping. Look, look what it says in verse 6. And whoever does not fall down and worship shall be cast immediately into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. So it wasn't just this is something we're asking you to do. This is something that if you don't do, you're, you're not going to make it. <laughs> you're not going to live through it. A little bit of pressure that's being placed on not only the whole province, but especially these young Jewish boys who knew truth from error. And they knew that all they had to do was compromise and they could have totally escaped any kind of scrutiny. And I think we're living in a time where, you know, you, you and I are going to have to make some decisions. Am I willing to compromise or am I willing to pay the price for not compromising? That's exactly what's happening here. It was at that time, verse 7, when all the people heard the sound of the horn, the flute, the harp, the lyre, the symphony, and all kinds of music, that all the people, nations, languages, fell down and worshipped the gold image which King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. So everybody, in unison, went along with Nebuchadnezzar's request to, to fell down and, and to worship except we're going to find out here three young men. And these three young men understood what the consequences were for not doing what Nebuchadnezzar had asked them to do. Thrown into the fiery furnace, right? That, that, that was, that was the, 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 the threat that would had already been established and everyone in the, in the province would have known what the threat was. Notice what happens in verse 8. Therefore, at that time, certain Chaldeans came forward and accused the Jews. They spoke and said to King Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever. You, O king, have made a decree that everyone who hears the sound of the horn, the flute, the harp, the lyre, the psaltery, and symphony with all kinds of music shall fall down and worship the gold image. And whoever does not fall down and worship shall be cast into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. There are certain Jews whom you have set over the affairs, over the providence of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, have not paid due regard to you, did not serve your gods or worship the gold image which you have set up. Wow. Certain Chaldeans went and snitched out <laughs> Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They said they're having Thanksgiving dinner with their family. Something like that. I don't know, folks. They got a phone call to the authorities. <laughs> Sent them over, had Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, you know, arrested. And what's incredible as you look at this whole picture is, you know, you, you look at, you know, you know and, and it's just kind of hard to fathom, you know, that pe people that are close to you would, would actually turn on you. People that, that you were, you know, kind of living alongside or even own family members would turn on you because you didn't go along with what everyone else was doing. An interesting passage, and in, in, in Jesus said this. Turn, turn, turn to Luke chapter 12 real quick. And, and I'll tell you, this passage never hit me like it's hit me these last couple months. Luke chapter 12. Look, look, at, look at verse 50. Fifty-one. Look at Jesus says this. Do you suppose that I came to bring peace on earth? I tell you, not at all, but rather division. For from now on, five in one house will be divided, three against two and two against three. Father will be divided against son, son against father, mother against daughter, and daughter against mother, mother-in-law against her daughter-in-law, and daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And I remember thinking, what? I mean, 
who, that, that's kind of crazy talk. Who would have families divided, their own son against their own father, their own father against their son? You see, you, you, you just kind of set a, a scenario where you have to divide people against one another and how quickly we're willing to turn on each other. We've seen it play out. I've had to sit down with families because mom and dad, you know, against their own children have, have had feuds because they didn't disagree with certain political things or certain, certain issues that are, that are being pushed upon them. And here they are, the Chaldeans come and they say, you know what, these guys here, they won't do what you've asked, O king. They, you know, they, they, they immediately went and snitched them out to the authorities. And King Nebuchadnezzar was furious that these guys weren't going to bow their knee to the image he made of himself. You see, council culture didn't start the last 10 years or five years. <laughs> this is council culture at its best right here. Because you don't go along with the program, man. You're, you're, you're going to get thrown into a fire and, and we're going we're gonna to get you out of, off the scene or out, out of the, the public arena or out of the public square in a heartbeat. And, it's, and it's, it's incredible because Nebuchadnezzar, verse 13 says, Nebuchadnezzar in rage and fury gave the command to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So they brought these men before the king. He's in rage. I mean, I mean he, he's beside himself. You know, who in the world do these guys think they are? They, you know, they were captives and they, they've come all the way over to, to, to Babylon. I didn't kill them. And then now they're going to disrespect me and they're not going to show their loyal to me and, and loyalty to me. And, and notice what Nebuchadnezzar said there in verse 14. Or actually, go, go back to verse 12. This was the accusation because I, I, think, I think we've got to get a little bit ahead here. Look what is the accusations. King, they have not paid do regard to you. That was the first accusation. They're not showing you honor. They're not showing you respect, king. No, number two is they do not serve your gods. They don't worship the gods that you worship. And they don't worship the gold image, what you've set up. Three, three accusations. You, you, the, the, these guys are, you know, just disrespecting you they, they, they don't they won't worship the gods that you that you worship and they won't worship you the image that you just made and the image was, was of himself that was the whole picture he was the, the head of gold and the accusations that were brought before you know him I think were an accusation against Nebuchadnezzar himself you put him in that position, King. You know, and it's really messing with his pride. These are guys you put in the position, and they won't do what you've asked them to do. And it was really, you know, kind of on Nebuchadnezzar's character that they were playing on. And so Nebuchadnezzar, in rage, fury, calls these men. Look at verse fourteen. And Nebuchadnezzar spoke, saying to them, "Is it?" true Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? That you do not serve my gods or worship the gold image which I have set up? And, and, and really what, what he's saying is, look, you got one last chance. I'm going to give you one more opportunity. Is it really true? I mean, are, are, are you going to hold to your guns now? And it, he gives them that one more opportunity, you know, you know, and, and I think, I think guys, for, for all of us, you know, th there's that time where we're willing to stand, we're willing to stand. And then somewhere we just kind of buckle. <laughs> 
And I think that's what Nebuchadnezzar was pushing for. You know, it was just like, hey, okay, you wouldn't do it over there and you wouldn't do it in that situation, but you know, I'm gonna give you one more chance and here I am watching you guys and I'm gonna give you that last opportunity. And look what he says in verse 10. If you are ready at the time you hear the sound of the horn, the flute, the harp, the lyre, the psaltery and symphony with all kinds of music and you fall down and worship the image which I have made good. But if you do not worship, you shall be cast immediately into the midst of a firing, a burning firing furnace. And who is the God who will deliver you from my hands? What's interesting is Nebuchadnezzar had already seen that God was able to interpret dreams. Dreams that, that not only the interpretation of the dream, but the dream itself. He was able to, to Daniel, declare to him because Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had prayed and God showed him the dream and the interpretation. And now, in, in essence, what he's doing is he's mocking God. He's saying, you know, what God is going to deliver you? You know, I'm the one in power. I'm the one in control. And how is your God ever going to come and intervene in this situation because I got the power and I'm going to burn you guys if you don't fall down and you don't worship me immediately? Now, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered. And they said to the king, Oh, Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. Now that verse strikes me. Because King, this is, this is enough for conversation. We don't even have to talk to you. We, we, and, and what they're saying is we've already made the decision before we ever stood before you of what we're going to do. And so this isn't going to be a discussion we're going to have. There's no need to talk right now. You, 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 you got to love the, 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 just the tenacity of these young men. It's not, it, 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 you're not going to change our minds. There's nothing you're going to say or there's nothing you're going to do that's going to influence from moving from the decision we've already made. And I'm convinced, guys, that, that if, if you don't have those determinations before you get put into the situation, then there's that option to compromise. If you don't put up all those barriers and say, you know what, th th this isn't even a conversation. This isn't somewhere I'm, I can even go. I I've already determined I'm not going there. So why even have the conversation about it? When it comes to your moral decisions in life. If you, don't, if you don't determine, you know what, I, 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 I'm not going to entertain the idea of another woman or another man. I'm not going to entertain the idea of, of being sexually active before I'm ever married. I, I'm not, that's not something that I, I'm even going to, you know, it's, I'm not going to go there. So that when the situation or opportunity is placed before you, you've, you've already made the decision, you know what, I, I, I can't even have that conversation. It's not even something that, that I, I, you know, I'm even open to. But if you don't determine that, you just can't say, well, let's just see where it goes. Let's just have that conversation. Let's see what happens. You know? and, and let me tell you, once you open that door, now you've given the enemy a foothold. When your boss at work asked you to 
tell a little white lie or to fudge a little here or a little bit there. You know, just, just kind of, you know, no, no one's ever going to know. No one's ever going to see. It's not a big deal. Just, just, you know, you'll keep your job if you do it. You know, if you don't deter me before, you know what, I, 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 I'm, a, I'm a person of integrity. I, I can't do that. But if you don't determine that beforehand, then you'll be open to the compromise. And these young men just said, look, we have no need to answer you concerning this matter. This isn't up for negotiation. It's just a waste of time to even talk about it. And then I love the next verse, verse 17. If that is the case, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace. And he will deliver us from your hand, O king. Because if that's the case, if you're going to throw us in the fire, let me tell you something. We serve a God that's more than able to deliver us from the circumstance that we find ourselves in. Our God's big enough to do it. Guys, that's a matter of faith. Do you believe that your God is big enough to handle your situation, your circumstance? If, if you don't compromise, that, that God's going to you know, sustain you or take care of you? Well, I might lose my job. Well... You put in your trust in your job or you put in your trust in God. And I think it's amazing because these young men understood that it wasn't just the loss of a job, it was going to be the loss of a life. That fiery furnace would have disintegrated them. But he says, my God's able to deliver me from the fiery furnace. You know, there's nothing that God is not capable of doing. Now, I also believe they understood that God was sovereign. Here, here's, here's what they knew. King, no matter what happens here today, God's delivering us from your hand. <laughs> If that means we go to heaven today because we got thrown in the fiery furnace, then we're not in your hand anymore. And if you throw us in there and God delivers us, then he's delivered us from your hand and, and your command. E either way, we win. And I think they were put in a lose-lose situation, but they didn't see it as a lose-lose situation. They saw it as a win-win situation. We're going to win one way or the other. Because if I, we do burn today, let me tell you something, we're now in God's presence. Now, I, I think, and, and really, that's really the heart of someone who has that kind of faith. I, I, I love Matthew chapter 10. Look, turn there real quick. Look at Matthew chapter 10, verse 28. Jesus talking in Matthew chapter 10. Well, what an incredible passage that whole chapter is. But look at Matthew chapter 10, verse 20, 28. And do not fear those who can kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. But rather fear him who's able to destroy both body and both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for one copper coin? And not one of them falls to the ground apart from your father's will. But the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Do not fear, therefore, you are of more value than many sparrows. I like that. He says, don't, don't fear what man can do. What, what all that man can do is send you to heaven. That's the most he can do to you. And I think Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego understood that. He said, you know what? No, no matter what this looks like, we're going to be delivered from your hand, King, today. We're going to be delivered. And then look what he says in verse 18. But if not. Let it be known to you, O king, that we do not serve your gods, nor will we worship the gold image which you have set up. Because <laughs> even if we don't get delivered in the physical sense, I want you to walk away with this, king. We're not bowing down to you or to the image that you've set up for us to worship. We're not going there. 
That is confidence in God's sovereignty and God's love for them. You see, there's those that walk around, they say, well, you know, if you just name it, you just claim it, you just, you know, declare it, whatever you say, that's what's going to happen. Now, that was pretty negative. If we, if we die today, then so be it. But let me tell you something, we didn't bow down to you. That they weren't putting their confidence in their words. They were putting confidence in the God who's in control of everything. And so those who won't say a negative word, because if you say a negative word, then you're speaking something that's going to bad. You know, let me tell you something. God's on the throne. His will is what you and I need to be confident in, not in, not in our words or our will. You know, and I, I'm not saying be negative, but I'm just saying is there's some people who just like, you know, don't, don't say you have a cold and you're sneezing and sniffling and coughing all over the place. You know, don't claim you have a cold brother. No, you're sick. Go take some medicine and go to bed. <laughs> and these guys just simply says, let me tell you something. God's in control. He's going to take care of us. He's going to sustain us. And, and if, if it be, if it be his will, then we're going to, you know, we're, we're going to, Burn in a fire today, then so be it. But let me tell you something. We're not bowing down to your God and we're not worshiping the, the image that you've set up. That's the fact. Then, verse 19, here we go. Nebuchadnezzar was full of fury. The expression on his face changed towards Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He spoke and commanded that they heat the furnace seven times more than it was usually heated. And, and, and what, what, what he's going to do is, you know what? Make the fire as hot as you can possibly make that fire. That, that was, I mean, he, he, was, he wanted that fire to be as hot as he was. And he was hot. <laughs> He was angry. He was full of fury. I mean, th th this guy was beside himself. You know, I, I, I'm, I'm, th these guys, they're, they're going to smoke so fast. They're not going to know what happened to him. And so they heat up the fire. He commanded certain mighty men of valor who were in his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He didn't just get normal men. He, you know, he got the Green Beret. You got the special forces, you know, he, he said, you know, I want the mighty man. I, I, you know, I, I, want, I want the brawny guys. I, I want the best of the best to bind these guys up. And they tied them all up. And, and notice what it, what it tells us, the details it tells us here. He says, these men were bound in their coats, their trousers, their turbans, and their other garments. And they were cast into the midst of the burning, fiery furnace. You know, and, and, and a, a normal situation, what they would do is they would strip them of everything. Then they would tie them up and they would throw them. And he says, man, he, he goes, just leave their trousers on them. Leave their turban on them. You know, their ball cap. They, 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 just tie them up right now and get them in that fire. And it tells us in verse 22, therefore, because the king's command was urgent and the furnace exceedingly hot, the flame of the fire killed those men who took Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. That fire was so hot as they opened up the furnace to go and toss these guys in. The guys tossing them in end up dying from the heat. So if you want to think, well, it was just a baby fire. That's why Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego didn't burn. No, it was a fire. <laughs> Seven times hotter than it normally was. It, it, it was it flames coming out. The front of the furnace as they were getting thrown into this into this furnace and it's, and it's incredible is that they get thrown in the other guys die the three men Shadrach Meshach and Abednego fell down bound in the midst of the burning fiery furnace and King Nebuchadnezzar was astonished he rose in haste and he spoke, saying to his counselor, Did we not cast three men bound into the midst of the fire? And the 
They answered and said to the king, true, O king. And he answered, I see four men loose walking in the midst of the fire and they're not hurt. And the form of the fourth is like the son of God. What a picture. These guys are walking around, you know, just kind of hanging out in the middle of the fire. Nebuchadnezzar's looking in there going, man, you know, my, my, my special forces just got, just died. And these guys are in there having a sauna. What's up with that? And then as he begins to look even closer, he realizes there's not three in there, but there's four in there. And his, and, and if, if, in the original language, it says one looks like the sons of, of, of God. Or, you know, it, it, in, in your New King James, it, it has capital S, you know, son of God. And, and, and what you and I automatically refer to would be Jesus Christ. And I believe this is a Christophany. But I don't think Nebuchadnezzar understood who Jesus was at this point. See, over and over in the Bible, Jesus makes appearances in the Old Testament. It's called a theophany as God is showing up in the Old Testament. A Christophany is Jesus showing up in the Old Testament. Abraham, when he was about, when Sodom and Gomorrah was about to be destroyed, it says the angel of the Lord came and he spoke along with two other angels, to Abraham. And Abraham interceded on behalf, on behalf of Sodom and Gomorrah. Lord, if there's just 50 righteous there, would you destroy the wicked with the righteous? And the Lord says, no, if there's 50, I won't destroy it. He goes, well, what if there's 45? He goes, no, nah, I won't destroy 45. What about 40? What about 30? You know, what about 10? And what's incredible is Jesus made an appearance when Gideon was, was hiding. It says, the angel of the Lord showed up to Gideon and he says, hey, mighty man of valor. He was another appearance of Christ in the Old Testament. Another interesting one was when Joshua was about to go into the promised land, it says that commander of the Lord's army stood there with a, with a sword drawn. It was the Lord. And here we have in, in this situation where once again, you know, you, you find the hand of God right there in the midst while they're in the fire. And it was something that, that God had told the prophet Isaiah. And Isaiah chapter 43, again, open your Bible. Isaiah 43, backwards, a couple books. This was prior to them being taken into captivity by the Babylonians. There in chapter 43, God is telling them, guys, you guys are going to go through all of these things. But let me tell you something, I'll be with you in the midst of it all. In Isaiah 43, it says, But now, thus says the Lord who created you, O Jacob, and he who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by your name. You are mine. And when you pass through the waters, I will be with you. Though the rivers, they shall not, and through the rivers, they shall not overflow you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned. Check this out. Nor shall the flame scorch you, for I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. And God promised that in the middle of, of all of your trial, tribulation, the floods, the fires, whatever it is you go through, you know, you put your trust in me and I will be with you in the midst of it. Guys, God's given us that same promise. If you hold on to him in the middle of your trial, he, he'll sustain you. He'll never leave you nor forsake you. Now, it, it isn't always easy. It, it isn't always comfortable. I 
I can't imagine what was going through their mind as, as that furnace opens up and the heat, they just begin to feel the heat of that fire kind of, you know, coming upon them. And then these big old burly men just kind of toss them into the fire and they're thinking, okay, I guess God didn't deliver us. But there they are standing in the middle of a fire. Kind of walking around. Nebuchadnezzar looking in and going, hey, you know, I thought we just threw three dudes in there. <laughs> How come there's four? No, notice, no, look at the next verse, man, incredible. And Nebuchadnezzar went near the mouth of the burning fiery furnace and he spoke saying, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, servants of the most high God, come out and come here. And Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego said, no, king, come in here. No, he didn't. <laughs> That's what I would have done. It's nice in here. Check it out. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego at that time, it says, they came from the midst of the fire. They, they weren't disrespecting the king, but they weren't going to disrespect God either. I, I, I like that, guys. We, we, you know, God has given us the responsibility to uh, come under the authorities that he's put into place. And, and, and I think we, we should, as Christians, be coming under the authorities until those authorities, you know, now make you choose between the authority and God. Once, when, once they're saying you have to now disobey God in order to obey the authority, that's, that's when the line's drawn. You say, okay, you know what? I choose to obey God rather than man. And there was a consequence for it, and they were willing to pay the consequence for it because they knew that God was the one who was going to be with them in the midst of it. And, and notice, notice how this plays out. And the satraps, the administrators, the governors, the king's counselors gathered together, and they saw these men on whose bodies the fire had no power. The hair of their head was not singed, nor was their garment affected by the smell, and the smell of fire was not on them. The fire had no power. Their clothes weren't burned. Their hair wasn't singed. The only thing that burned was the ropes that held them because they, they were no longer bound. And so now they're, you know, they're standing before the king and says, and they didn't even smell like fire. You know, you, you, you sit in front of a, a fire pit for two minutes, you smell like fire. These guys are hanging out in the middle of the fire and they didn't smell like fire. <laughs> and I think you see, what, 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 the, what the whole picture is, is that God is able to protect you. God's able to sustain. No matter what you endure, no matter what you go through, God's bigger than any situation you're going to find yourself in. I think the bigger picture here, guys, is, is that God is telling the nation of Israel that no matter what you go through, I'll be with you. Think, think about what's happened. The Holocaust. I mean, uh, uh, incredible. Fire. Six million Jews, uh, you know, incinerated. But yet they're still a nation. In the midst of all of their horror and all of the trial and tribulation and and. All of it because of their rebellion against God. But God never forsook them. God never gave up on them. That God still brought them into the land of promise. And he's still with them today. Let me tell you something, guys. When you look at all of prophecy, it doesn't revolve around the United States. It doesn't revolve around, um, you know, Europe. It all revolves around Jerusalem and the nation of Israel. All of it. Because it all has to do with God's faithfulness and God's promises that he never, ever, ever reneges on. Never. The nation of Israel for 2,000 years scattered throughout the nations. And yet God brings them back into the land. No nations ever survived being separated like that except for the nation of Israel. 
And all of it he foretold in Ezekiel chapter 38 and chapter 39. We'll be looking at that when we get further in Daniel. That God promised that, that he would bring them back into the land after they were dry bones. Because God's promises never fail. God's always faithful. Anything God says, he does. And so when you look at what's going on in our world, you, you just kind of like, okay, where are we at in this prophetic, you know, line here? Where, you know, where, where does all this fit into what God has already declared? Because God's already declared it's going to happen. Because he's faithful. And as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abendo there come out of the fire, they didn't smell like smoke. They and then, uh, I, I love this. Look at, look at verse 28. Nebuchadnezzar spoke saying, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who sent his angel and delivered his servants who trusted in him. And they have frustrated the king's words. They yielded their bodies that they should not serve nor worship any god except their own god. This is a heathen king and he understood what had just transpired. Blessed be the God of, Abra uh, of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. His angel, I, I saw him with my own eyes. His angel was right there in the midst of, 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 of the fire with them. And they trusted God even at the expense of their own bodies. You, 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 you want to be a witness for Christ? You want to be an instrument that God can use? Then, then you obey God at, at no, no matter what the cost is and you watch what God will do in the lives of those who were watching your life. Because you can tell people all you want about your faith, but when they see your faith lived out, that's a whole different thing. I'm going to obey God no matter, no matter what man says, no, no matter what the world does, no, no matter what the culture says, no matter what you know, everyone else is doing. I'm going to do what God said because I believe that God is the one who's in control. And when people see that kind of faith lived out, even, even King Nebuchadnezzar can't deny it. Even King Nebuchadnezzar is sitting there going, man, let me tell you something. Your God is the God who's more powerful than any God that the Babylonians have. He, he wasn't ready to bow his knee yet. It's not, chapter 4 he does. And, and the, the, you know, the, the crazy thing is, is ne think about what Nebuchadnezzar had to go through. He, he went, he went in, in chapter 2 to see that God is able to not only know dreams and interpret dreams, that God's able to deliver from the fire. When you get to chapter 4, he thinks that he's in control of everything, and God humbles him, and God makes him into an ox. Well, he like an ox. He's walking around eating, chewing the cud for seven years. And then he wakes up and he goes, I praise the Lord God of heaven. <laughs> and some of us are that stubborn that, you know, you, you, God, God will show you and God will show you. And then he goes, okay, you don't want to listen. I'll, I'll, I'll turn you into a donkey or something. And what's, what's amazing is, is in this whole picture Nebuchadnezzar is going to make a decree. Watch the decree. Watch this. Verse 29. Therefore, I make a decree that any people, nation, or language which speaks anything amiss against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be cut in pieces, and their houses shall be made as ash sheets, because there is no other God who can deliver like this. Love that. He was, he's had something about, some fascination about cutting people into pieces, though. It was like, you know, he was going to turn, all, in chapter 2, remember, he was going to cut up all the guys that couldn't answer his, interpret his dream for him. He was going to cut them into little pieces. And now he says, look, if you say anything amiss, you, you, you talk any trash about the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, little pieces for you. You'll be chopped up. But he understood something. There is no other God who can deliver like this. Guys, there's no other God. 
that can deliver like the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Nebuchadnezzar is going to find that out for himself. We'll, we'll, we'll look at that next week in chapter 4. He's going, to, he's going to find out for himself that he's not in control. God is. You might think you're bad and tough and invincible. Let me tell you something, man. You, you, you are nothing but a vapor. You'll be here today and you'll be gone tomorrow. Big and bad guys have come and gone since the beginning of time. God is the one who's in control. And either you bow your knee to him or you're crushed. Nebuchadnezzar is going to find that out the hard way. He's going to find out that, that you know, all, 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 all of the things he was attempting to, to do, you know, it all meant nothing because it was not going to be long before, you know, he, he falls off the scene. His son's going to come into power and then the, the, the Medo-Persian Empire is going to come and, and take away the kingdom of, of Babylon and the Medo-Persian Empire will, will come in and we'll be looking at that just in a few chapters. And the Medo-Persian Empire will last for a little while. And then the, the, you know, the Grecian Empire, the Greeks, Alexander the Great is going to come and defeat them. And then the Romans. And what's incredible, you know, as you look at this whole thing, you, you realize that, you know, God's the one who's able to deliver, to sustain. God's the one who sits on the heavens. He's the one who sits on the throne. And as you look at this, you know, last chapter, it's incredible because those who submit themselves to God are elevated. They're promoted. Now, now you, you, it might not be on this earth, but the, this, is, this is what Jesus says. If you're faithful with the little things, you'll be entrusted with greater things in the kingdom to come. If you're faithful now, then when you get to the heavenly kingdom, you're going to be entrusted with great responsibilities there. And as you look at this last verse, look at verse 30 of, of the chapter. It says, and the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. They, they, they were already, remember in chapter 2, they had, they had already been promoted. But now they, they were even promoted into greater roles and responsibilities in Babylon. This is the last we'll hear of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. All, all, all the rest of it's going to, you know, Daniel will have a play in it. But Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego just kind of fall off the the map from this point forward. Given great responsibility, you know, they, they, they had a, a, a great position in Babylon because they had proven themselves to be faithful, not, not to Nebuchadnezzar, but to God. And when you're faithful to God, man, God has a way of doing things that, 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 are, that are outside of the natural. He does the supernatural. What, 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 what kind of story is that when you, you got the kids that were taken into from captivity and now they're the, the leaders in the province of Babylon, right? Only God. Only God. Daniel's going to be the, you know, the, the king's right-hand man. We'll, we'll see that as we, as we go through, you know, chapter 4 and, and 5 and 6. And, and you know, you just, you, just, you just watch this whole thing play out and, and you realize that, you know what, God had put Daniel in this position. Why? Because Daniel was faithful in the little things. And because he was faithful in the little things, God was entrusting him with greater things. It was back in chapter 1 where, where Daniel said, you know what, I, I don't want to defile myself with the king's delicacies. You know, I, I, would, I would rather eat vegetables than, than defile myself and compromise in this one area of my life so that I, I, would, I would be dishonoring God with my life. And how, how is it, guys, that you and I are living in a world where, where compromise is happening all around us and you and I, God has given us the ability to not give in, to not compromise. To be faithful men and women. 
to be those who put our, our, our trust in the Lord and, and to know that, you know what, God is the one who's going to sustain me. He's going to protect me. I, I don't have to worry about what man thinks about me. I need to worry about what God thinks about me. And if I live with that as my priority, man, that, then, you know, God is going to honor it. God will bless it. God, God will go before me. And Father, we thank you for the examples of men like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, God. What, a, what an incredible account That God, you're able to sustain even in fire and flood. And God, we thank you that, Lord, just like these men who were thrown in that fire, you were right there with them in the midst of it all. And so, Father, we ask, Lord, that, that God, you would, Lord, give us that same kind of faith to trust you no matter what. temptations are brought before us what threats Father we ask that you would give us the power to overcome and Father I pray Lord maybe for some of us God we, we've never bowed our knee like Nebuchadnezzar in this account, Lord. He, he even acknowledged that you're God, that you are greater than all the gods of Babylon, but he still hasn't surrendered his heart to you. And that it wouldn't take, God, you bring us to our lowest point to get our attention. That we would just acknowledge that we need you, that you're the Savior and you're the one who's able to free us from the bondage of, of sin and the consequence of sin. That you're the one who's able to, Lord, help us in our greatest dilemma, God. And so, Father, we ask your Holy Spirit just continue to work, God, in our midst, in this place. God, continue to change us and mold us and shape us. And, Lord, your word, God, would just, just cut through all of the lies and all of the deception Father, we ask for your Holy Spirit to work God, mightily in our culture, in our community, Lord, in this valley, amongst our young men and young women. And Lord, would you go before us now? We love you, God. We thank you. We ask all these things in Jesus' name.